I don't know. Okay, so we are recording. Um, I hope, because now I can't see my screen, but the camera's on, so I hope this is recording. Um, welcome to another week, week four. After tonight, we'll be halfway through. It's pretty exciting, maybe, or sad, depending on how you look at it. Um, the uh, we're, we're steadily progressing, moving along here through some of our uh, theories of ethical uh, thinking, um, and we're going to talk about a different one today. But before we do that, I need to go back and talk about a little bit of stuff, uh, specifically the papers I just handed back to you. Um, there's a man, I don't want it's not everybody, but there is a recurring issue with this paper in particular. Uh, and maybe I should have talked about it in advance, but I, I feel like it's one of the sort of thing that I, I want to see who gets it and who doesn't. Um, so something that always happens with this paper in particular is, um, is that we have a hard time sometimes recognizing what the writer is doing, what he's trying to accomplish, right? What his, what his sort of his, his tools for accomplishing what he's trying to accomplish. Um, the title of this paper by James Rachels, right? By the way, his name is Rachels with an S on the end, not Rachel. Right? Uh, so the the title of the paper that James Rachels has written to us, or written to us, written is morality is not relative. So just from the beginning, before you even start reading, what do you think Rachels's point is going to be? Like, what do you think his final thesis is about cultural relativism? That's right. Cultural relativism is not the way. And that's right, that's just his term for ethical relativism. Ethical relativism is not the way to determine morality. All right? And I think we get that in the title. We don't have to go any further than that. And what does that mean? Right? If we think that James Rachels is not a fan of ethical relativism, then what does that end up meaning? I mean, just paraphrase the simple, short, 30-second version. What does that mean? No, knowing what we know about ethical relativism, what will it mean to say that you don't believe that that's the way to go? No, no, neither, right? Relative, remember, cultural relativism, or yeah, the psychological relativism is what we call it in class, that, that has nothing to do with morality, or at least establishing morality. All that that says is that people act according to their own customs. Morality isn't fluid, okay. Sure, morality isn't fluid, but then we have to define what you mean by fluid. Yes. 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 Right. That there is a definitive right and wrong in some circumstances. Maybe not in every circumstance, but definitely in some circumstances, there are things that are right and things that are wrong, regardless of where you grew up, who taught you right from wrong, the you know the whatever your your cultural background in any way doesn't actually impact some things, right? That's his whole thesis. If we say that morality is not relative, then he's saying that some morality, at least, is objective, meaning it is, it is not subjective. It's not, it doesn't depend on the subject. It doesn't depend upon the view viewer. It is true no matter what. So if you wrote a paper in which you were summarizing the arguments of Rachel's, and you told me something like, well, everybody has their own opinion, and, you know, right? You can't, who are we to judge? And some people are right about this, and some people are right about that. Then, then that, you missed the whole point. You missed the whole point of the paper. And we can see that right from the beginning. Now, what, what people did 
frequently is they started to read the paper and they note that at the beginning of the paper, he brings up some examples like the Greeks and the Galatians, right? And he talks about the Eskimos. And I got a lot of talk in papers about the Greeks and versus the Galatians and the Eskimos. And so the, and the, the moral of that story seems to be, well, some people are different and that's okay. That's totally the opposite of what James Rachels is trying to do. Why does he talk about the Greeks versus the Galatians? Why does he talk about the Eskimos? What's his tactic here? Yeah. Sure, sure. That's and, and that's but but even more basic than that. Wow. Wow, you know you have power when when other people get up out of your seat. No. <laughs> um at the basis of the paper, all he's doing is laying out examples that he can then refute. In fact, that's a great way to write a philosophical paper to say here's one way of looking at things, and I'm going to explain it to you very clearly, and then I'm going to show you why it's wrong. But it seems that some people got caught up in just that, just the first basic, basically, yeah, the first two pages. All right, you get to here, and do, 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 do. oops, I'm going the wrong way. And um, do, 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 do. if we assume that our ideas and of right and wrong will be shared by all peoples at all times, we are merely naive. Boom. To many thinkers, this observation that different cultures have different moral codes has seemed to be the key to understanding morality, right? He's setting it up as he's describing cultural relativism to us. But then he goes on to say, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's not the way. All right? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Um, da -da 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 -da. Moreover, yeah, he even gives the argument for it very carefully, right? Different societies have different codes. There is no objective standard. The moral code of our own society, right, is based, has no special status. It's merely one among many. There is no universal truth in ethics. That's totally the opposite of what he's going to say later, right? His whole point later is, no, there totally is universal truth in ethics, right? But we have to look past this. We have to read this and then keep going, right? And he gives us the form of argument. Um, that's based, that cultural relativism is based on. And so we scroll down, all right, he gives us the whole argument, the whole argument, and then, but then he, but then he starts to say that's wrong, all right? This is where he, does it follow from the mere fact that the Galatians and the Greeks disagreed that there is no objective truth? Of course not. It does not follow. Right? Just because they disagree does not mean that an objective truth is impossible. In the same way that people used to disagree about, disagree about whether the world was flat or round, but one of them was right, and the other one was wrong. And so disagreement does not disallow an actual fact, an actual truth to exist. Yes? That's the whole, that's, that's summary, that's argument number one right there, boom. All right, done. Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm not sure. All I, mean, I, I, I wanted to talk about this just because I think it's important that we understand. I mean, I encourage you to go back and, and if I, if I gave you kind of a poor grade on this paper because because you did that, I encourage you to go back, reread the article, and rewrite the paper. Um, I know we don't all have infinite time, but if you have a chance, I think that would be a good thing for you to do. Um, it will end up being better for you, not just for your grade, because I'll probably bump your grade up some, but also for you to actually get out of this assignment what was intended, which is that you actually see a good argument, a good formal philosophical argument and how it's constructed. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, I suggest you read the whole thing. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if the pages are numbered. I, I mean, the, the, the thing is you really need the whole, I mean, you really need the whole paper. Yeah, no, 
so I don't, I mean, I don't think the pages are numbered, but the, okay, yeah, 455, but you, you really need to get, to get the summary of, of his whole thing. You really need to hold, read the whole thing and carefully, right? That's, I, I think I may mention this on the first day, uh, on the first class, but it's really one of the most important things about what we're trying to do in this class is the ability to read carefully, right? Working on practicing, reading carefully, and then writing carefully. Writing carefully. So those two things are kind of what we're trying to get out of this class. Yes? Other question? How about this? Okay. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. So. Were there any other thoughts about egoism? We talked about last week and that you wrote about for today, uh, objectivism, Ayn Rand, any of that stuff that you guys wanted to ask about or comment on before we move on. I don't want to leave that behind right away. We're okay? All right. All right. We're seeming a little subdued today. I, used, I just ate a whole bag of Skittles. And half a Coke, so so I'm ready to go. I know. Yeah, and it's not from McDonald's. Oh, man. Um, today we're going to talk about utilitarianism, the idea of utility, um, and how that works towards, um, towards establishing the right, the good. Well, <clears throat> and I'm going to start off with a video, because this video is totally going to, it's actually two short videos, and they're totally going to explain to you utility all by themselves. It's going to be easy. All right. And here we go. Good boy. We have a problem. Something may be wrong in regular one. We've been ordered to investigate. Memory serves. Regular One is a scientific research laboratory. I don't start to command all we have. Or both children. But we're the only ship in the quantum. As far as these investigators, how good are they? How will they respond to real pressure? As with all living things, each according to his gifts. Of course, the ship is yours. Not the whole business. Just give me to regular one. As a teacher on a training mission, I am content to command the enterprise. If we could go on actual duty, it is clear that the senior officer on board must assume command. It may be not. Careful communications. You take a shim. You proceed from a false assumption. I am a Vulcan. I have no ego to bruise. You're about to remind me that logic alone dictates your action. I would not remind you of that which you know so well. If I may be so bold, it was a mistake for you to accept promotion. Commanding a starship is your first best destiny. Anything else is a waste of material. I would not presume to debate you. That is wise. In any case, were I to invoke logic, Logic clearly dictates that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Number one. You are my superior officer. You are also my friend. I have been and always shall be yours. All right. So that's video number one. This is, by the way, after Spock has flung himself into the reactor core to restart the engine to save the whole ship, in case you haven't seen the Wrath of Khan, and you're some sort of weirdo.
shit. I'm in danger. Yes. Don't breathe. Just watch it. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or the one. I could stop here, but I never do. Yes, that's the sad part. Um, what's the point? Well, sure, sure. Spock should have died. That's not the point. <laughs> that's, that's not why I showed you that, <laughs> to remind everybody that Spock should have died. Um, what's the point? So imagine a train track. There is a branch in said train track. I'm going to, this is not to scale, nor is it particularly well drawn. All right. And there is a train chugging down the track. I don't know why it has so many wheels. Um, chugging down the track. There are on this track five people working. To fix the track, they're like steep gorge here. They're in like a valley, so they can't get off the track. Right? There's nothing to do. If the train comes through, it's going to hit them. It's going to kill them. On this track over here, this branch of the track, there's only one person. You are standing here next to the lever that determines which track the train goes down. It's going too fast. There's no way it can stop. It's right. chugging along. The, all you can do is pick left or right for the tracks. Which one do you pick? Go some. <laughs> all six people. All six people are construction workers, and therefore are of the age that construction right in that region. Yes, that's right. They're they're perfect sacrificial targets. They're probably all virgins, right? And so, <laughs> sacrifice is thrown into a volcano later. Better. Are they finished with the train track? They are finished with the train track. Yes, the train's going through either way. Left. As Tony says, left. Anybody argue with left? I mean, left is usually the answer. If the train track wasn't fixed, I would have said. Sure, right. If you're going to crash the whole train, maybe, right, who knows how many people are on the train. But he, the train's going to survive either way. So the only few thing you have to worry about is these five guys versus this one guy. So Left. One, you kill one, not five. Yeah. It's an interesting use of vocabulary, by the way, to kill. You kill. <laughs> Seriously, it's an interesting question. Ah, that's different. Letting one die versus killing one is slightly, well, it's just a different vocabulary because we could change this, like, we could change this. We could take away this branch, right? Take away the branch, but instead, there's a bridge that goes over, that goes over the train tracks. And you're standing on the bridge next to a really big guy who is so big that if you shoved him in front of the train, it would stop the train. But it would totally kill him. Now that, right? There's a difference. There's a difference between the first scenario where you're someone's going to die, so you are sort of you're kind of deciding who dies, but you're just letting that it's not your fault that anybody's going to die because somebody's going to die. Versus, I'm going to kill this guy, 
to save these guys, right? And that's, I mean, there, it's an, that's a complicated, there are all sorts of ways you can complicate this scenario. And that's maybe gives a slightly different feel to it, right? I don't know. I don't, I don't want to get into that yet. But yeah, Crystal. Yeah. Think of the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, do you think it's the same thing? Like, so, um, oh, I hesitate to bring up this example. Eh, it's in my head. I'm going to do it. No, I only hesitated because it's, well, you guys all saw the hurricane. It hit Florida, right? Irma hit Florida. And on the news, they always show these looters. Right? And I, I hate it because looting really isn't that big a deal. There aren't that many looters in the world. And the news makes a big deal out of it because it's sensational and, ooh, look, look, look. And so I hesitate to bring it up. But it's on my, on my mind, so here I am. Uh, there's a difference, right? Maybe there's a difference. Do you see a difference is my question between I break into the store and steal something versus I see someone break into a store and steal something? and don't do anything about it. Yeah. Right, there's, there seems to be a big difference between doing something and letting something happen. Sure. But that's, but my, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that they're not both bad. I'm just saying they're not the same. Well, that's not, but in this area specifically, Why? Said, are we going to push the big yeah. guy down yeah. and save five? Yeah. <clears throat> or are we going to pull the lever and say, okay, we're going to push the big guy down and save five? Because the only difference in that is you're physically having to touch one. I've still decided, what if, I don't know how to explain it, but like. You don't think there's a difference, like if you had to talk to somebody about this later, right? The police show up and they're like, oh my gosh, because someone's dead. Please show up. They're like, what happened? Well, the train ran over that guy, and I had to, someone was going to die, and so I had to let that guy die. Versus, I killed this dude to save those people. That's, I don't want to get, I don't want to get caught up in this distinction yet. Okay? This is not, not the point of this conversation yet. We'll get there. We'll get there. The point being fundamentally is, just what Spock said, right? The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, right? We all, I, I don't want to speak for anybody, but it seems like most people are in favor of the idea that it's better to let one person die than to let five people die. And at least some people think it's actually better to kill one person than to let five people die. That's totally what you just did. That's totally what you just said. It is, right. Right. So, so if, okay. So let me say that again in exactly the same words. It's better to let one person die than to let five people die. And, I, I know. You are actually causing that person to die, no matter how you spin it. You, you, you made the conscious decision that this one is better than those five. Yeah. If you're the, it, things will worse when you push the guy, but you're still actively making that decision. But what about the fact that you all laughed when I said kill just a second ago, right? That you, I said, well, but, but you reacted. You all reacted, right? And you're saying they're exactly the same thing. And so I said that both of those things, and you guys didn't have a problem with it when I said it the first one, but you did have a problem with it. You did. All right. So, so just listen again. Just listen again, right? So it's better to let one person die than to let five people die. And it's better to kill one person than to let five people die. You're saying those are exactly the same sentence. Well, not, I mean, not the same words, but. All right. All right. 
I mean, again, again, I, sorry, I shouldn't have brought it up again. I'm trying, I really am trying to get away from this for a second. What if you don't? What if it's already aiming at that one guy and you just choose not to mess with it? All right. All right. Well, if I change it, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. That, that's not one of the options. You don't get to replace your the person on the track with yourself. You don't get to sacrifice yourself. Sure, but you're not Spock. You're not Spock. You're not Spock. All right. So the idea, right, behind utility, utilitarianism. The whole point of utilitarianism is uh, that we're going to try to maximize pleasure, right, as, as much pleasure as for as many people as possible, and minimize pain, unhappiness, whatever you want to call it. So maximizing good, minimizing bad. That's the whole idea behind this concept of utilitarianism. And before we get too far into what that means and how we figure it out, we need a little bit of history. It starts with this guy named Jeremy Bentham. And he's a British guy. I don't remember his exact years, but he lives in the 18th century. So 17 something or other. Um, and he, he really focuses on this idea. Sorry, I'm just. Okay, yep, looks like it's working. I just got really big in everybody's face there. Um, the, uh, he, he is looking at the way the world is. The, England at that time is really a pretty horrible place to live for a lot of people. Feudalism has just sort of ended, and we're moving into this industrial society where you've got some very, very rich people, a whole lot of very, very poor people, and then a medium number of people in the middle. And society is stratifying itself pretty significantly. Uh, working conditions are horrible. Uh, child labor is a thing. Uh, basically, everything, if you've read anything by Dickens, right? Anything, everything that's in Dickens is happening right now. Um, there are uh, just, it, it's just, it's just a pretty horrible place to live. And Jeremy Bentham, that's an E, by the way, is trying to figure out a system, really to, to adjust the legal system in England, but he's trying to figure out a system that will allow him to make the world better for everybody. Right? He's trying to figure out how do, we, how do we change things? How do we determine right and wrong in a way that makes the world better for folks? Um, and, uh, and he's living in the period, this particular period, was known as the age of enlightenment, enlightenment, you can say it, Enlightenment or the age of reason, right? Everybody at this time, not everybody, but a lot of very intelligent thinkers during this period of time have decided that reason is the way to go rather than sort of relying on religion or relying on sort of, uh, you know, just uh, monarchy, like it's just going to, rules are just going to be passed down from above or that sort of thing, right? We're really trying to think about and use our rationality as humans to figure out what is the right way to, to move forward. And this is where we get a lot of our kind of, this time period is when we get a lot of our best sort of thought in terms of political thought, right? This is the same time that the United States is being born and people are you know, writing constitutions and things. We've got all sorts of great science and math going on with Rene Descartes and Newton, right? And, uh, and so on. So there's a lot of cool stuff happening at this period of time. Jeremy Bentham says, I'm gonna figure out the best way to do things. And so he establishes this idea of utility and his hedonistic calculus. And in a hedonistic calculus, right, and calculus here is not calculus like you may have seen in high school where you've got derivatives in the area under the curve, right? He's not talking about that kind of calculus. He's talking about just calculating, doing the math. Right? Doing the math, hedonistic math, basically. What is hedonism? What does hedonistic mean? Something about heathens? Yeah, heathen and heathen. 
are not are are different. Yeah, yeah. Heat on. No, I, we don't need the Greek. The word heat on is a Greek word, ancient Greek word that just means pleasure. So hedonism is this idea that we are seeking pleasure. We're trying to increase pleasure. Right? And now, in, t in today's world, hedonism has sort of a negative connotation, like, oh, you're just a hedonist, you just want to go out and drink and party and, you know, do stuff you're not supposed to just because you just want to feel good all the time. Right? Um, and that's what hedonism kind of means today. But that's not the way that Bentham means it. Right? He's basing it in the same way that this guy Epicurus, who was an ancient Greek, Epicurus, oh, oh wow. I don't think Epicurus has ever gotten that reaction in my class before. <laughs> What's wrong with Epicurus? Nothing. So oh. Epicurus I hope not. Epicurus, like, he would have like these parties that would last for days and days and days, where that they would have pleasure, but it wasn't like you just going all out doing crazy stuff to hurt yourself. It was like you sit slowly, eat your grapes, and enjoy yourself. Kind of pacing yourself without going all <laughs> Sure, because everybody likes grapes. Yeah, and uh, Yeah, Epicurus gets a bad rap. Epicurus was like the first hedonist. He was the first guy who was like, yeah, the whole point of life is to be like to have pleasure. Like pleasure is the point of life, and he proved it with a thing called the cradle argument. Right, take a baby out of the cradle, put it on the ground. Right, there's some rough uncomfortable pointy rocks over here and some nice soft carpeting over here where will the baby go to the carpet it will avoid the pain right it will avoid discomfort and pain babies naturally avoid things like fire and sharp stuff right that's just just it's built into them they don't have to like think about it and so his point is well obviously as human beings we are constructed to seek pleasure and avoid pain so that's the point of life must be so how do we do that? And he established hedonism. He was like the first hedonist. Uh, but his hedonism is more like Bentham's and much less like what we think of when we think of today as hedonism. His idea was not that you should go out and get drunk all the time and eat lots of really fancy food and so on, because ultimately, while that might give you momentary pleasure, like, oh, this is so good, all of this like chocolate pudding, mm. but in, in six hours, you're gonna be sick and you're gonna feel miserable and you might like, gain a lot of weight and then be unhealthy and so on. So he was thinking in terms of long-term pleasure. So he believed that actually the best thing to do was just to like eat bread and cheese and drink water. And he lived in a little room that had a cot and books and that was it, right? That was his idea of pleasure, right? He really was trying aiming at absence from, of pain more than he was aiming at pleasure. So how to have no pain in your life was to avoid anything that could bring you stress or obviously physical pain, but mental pain, any sort of any sort of anxiety like that he was trying to avoid. And Bentham's kind of along those lines too. I just sorry, I just that was totally off off track. I just went off in a direction I shouldn't have. Um, his point is, right? Bentham's point is we have to do the math for our pleasure to figure out what is the right thing to do. It's worth noting that the uh, so let me actually not talk about that yet. Um, so any act that you do can have a certain amount of value to it. And there are two kinds of value, according to Bentham. Intrinsic value and instrumental value. Something that has intrinsic value makes you happy by itself. It is something that you do that makes you happy, that brings pleasure. Something that will ultimately bring you pleasure, but doesn't on its own, has instrumental value. So for example, uh, breathe. Uh, he's, he's not so worried about specific, like you can't not breathe. That's not, there's not even a thought there. He's talking about trying to decide action. So things that you can't help doing don't have any moral value one way or the other, right? in his mind. He's, th he's thinking about like, um, uh, you know, a thing you like to do. Going to the water park, because you like going to water parks, that has intrinsic value. You enjoy going to water parks, so when you go to the water park, that action has intrinsic value. Makes you happy. 
getting up in the morning and going to work does not make you happy. However, it provides you with the money that allows you to go to the water park, and that makes you happy. So getting up and going to work has instrumental value. Does that make sense? Yes, so one leads to the other. Okay. Um, and so he talks about all actions having either positive or negative intrinsic value, right? Like getting shots at the doctor, that has negative intrinsic value, but it has positive instrumental value because it keeps you from getting sick, right? So, and, and any action can have any combination. Some things have both intrinsic and instrumental value. You might really enjoy your job, right? So that you both get intrinsic value out of it and instrumental value because it allows you to do other things that you enjoy. Bentham says, basically, if you're trying to decide what to do at any given moment, you need to calculate, right, do the math, do the calculus to determine how much pleasure it will bring. And if it brings more pleasure than it brings displeasure, more pleasure than it brings pain, then it is a good thing to do. But if it brings more pain than it brings pleasure, it is a bad thing to do. And you might think, well, okay, but what do you mean by pleasure? Because we don't just mean like, ooh, that feels good, right? He means pleasure in a lot of different ways. And so he actually describes these seven categories for, for, our, for measuring one's pleasure. Um, and so we can kind of imagine that each one of these is on a scale from negative 10 to 10, right? Just because we like 10 as our number. I'm just using this as an example. It doesn't have to be. It could be, you know. One to three or whatever, but negative 10 to 10, where zero is totally neutral. 10 is way awesome, positive, best thing you've ever done in your life, cool. And negative 10 is really, really, really horrible. Worst day ever. And using that scale, you could theoretically establish a total number right, by rating anything that you do in these seven categories. The intensity of the pleasure, right? Let's say you're going to do a thing. Call it action X. What is the intensity of the pleasure? How pleasurable is it? Right. How awesome is it? The duration of the pleasure. Is it something that's only going to last for a second? Or is it going to extend for a long time? Something you'll be able to use over and over again, something like that. How certain is the pleasure? Are you positive that this is actually going to lead to to positive feelings, or might it, might it not? Might it? Maybe there's a chance it'll end up being sort of uh, crummy, um, or, or in fact, really bad. Right? Could go the other direction, the negative, the propinquity. That's a really fun word. Uh, as in, how near, how soon will that pleasure happen? Right? Do I get it instantaneously, or is it a delayed gratification sort of thing, where I have to wait? Right? Like going to college. All right. Ultimately, that will lead to some sort of positive thing, but you might have years to wait until you get there. Um, or, you know, you might do something that's happening tomorrow. Fecundity, how, uh, how likely is that pleasure to lead to additional pleasures? All right, that could be uh, taken into account. The purity of the pleasure, is it truly, is it just good or is it good mixed with some bad for some people and so on? And then the extent, how many people get pleasure out of this? And when you do all the math, you should come up with a number. And if that number is positive, do it. And if it's negative, don't. That was Bentham's whole idea. That's obviously a little simple, but we can imagine at least the concept. Right? One thing that's worth remembering here, well, is everybody, anybody have any questions? Does this make sense? It's one of those things that's actually more complicated by explaining it than it is just sort of like saying, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. All right, done. Um, remember, we talked about this word. We talked about teleology, uh, I think, last week. Does anybody remember what teleology is? Marissa, what? 
a theory that focuses on the consequences. A theory that focuses on the consequences of actions. So we are thinking here about consequences of our actions. And that seems pretty clear. If anything has ever been focused on consequences, it's this theory. Right? The whole idea is how much pleasure will come out of that action. Right? What are the consequences of this action? How much pleasure will it bring me? How much pain will it bring others? How do I do that math? All right. So I've got the train chugging along. It's going to kill five people or it's going to kill one person. I'm trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain, knowing that five people right, is a greater extent than one person of that of pleasure, right? in that sense, where the pleasure is avoiding dying, right? or, or we can think about it negatively in terms of uh, the pain is being run over by a train, and that's probably a pretty negative pleasure score. Right? So we want to minimize the extent of that pain, so we aim it at the one rather than the five. Yes? So Bentham says it's obvious that you aim the, tra aim the train at one person. Aim the train at one person rather than at five people. And so obviously here, again, the focus is on the consequences of the action. Not, he's not asking himself, well, or himself, is it, well, is it right to pull... To, you know, to, to steer trains. I'm not a conductor. I'm not trained for this. This is probably I'm breaking some sort of law by steering this train. That's not it, right? He doesn't care about that sort of question. He just wants to know what's, what are the outcomes, right? That's how you determine if something is good. Does it, does it do good in the world, right? Or does it do bad in the world? If it does good, it's good. If it does bad, it's bad. That's kind of his point. And that's the theory behind a teleological argument. And I bring this up again because we're going we're gonna to discuss the opposite, a different sort of style next week when we talk about Kant. We're going to talk about a deontological or, uh, theory that doesn't focus so much on the consequences. Which one? Kant? No. Kant is deontological. Deont but you don't have to worry about that yet. We're going to talk about it next week. This one's teleological because it focuses on the consequences. Questions? How does this seem to us in terms of, that's the whole thing, by the way. I mean, there, there are some added complications slightly, but that's basically the whole theory. How does it seem? It seems that if I would take the train and bring it at the five people, I might wreck the train and hurt more people. Even more reason not to, not to aim it at the five people. Right, because you, your certainty, right? You've got a, a a lower degree of certainty that it's going to right, only kill those five people. Right? So we've got to take that into account as well in our math. Um, generally, how do we feel? Is this a way that we make decisions? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, how do we use this already? Even if you've never heard of utilitarianism, you've probably used a similar system, but what do we, we call that something else? We don't call it utilitarianism. Like you're trying to decide if you should quit your job and go back to school. You make a what? A what? A you have a list of pros and cons, right? You make a pros and cons list, and that's all this is, right? It's just a list of pros and cons. You all oh, these are the positives, and these are the negative possible outcomes. And then you say, and then you do the math. You do the math. What's the problem with pros and cons lists? What, Chelsea? Why can they go on and on and on? The millions of pros and cons. I'm going to come back to that. That's actually a really good point, but I don't think, that's not what I was looking for yet. Lots of things that, not yet, not yet, not yet, little wooden boy. Why don't, do pros and cons lists work? Not really, why not? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's kind of what Chelsea was talking about. Yeah, because, because none of us are objective. Yeah, right? We're all, you know, the thing we really want to do, even if we only have four pros and ten cons, but I, but I really want to do this, we do it anyway, right? So it's, right, we're, we're establishing those pros ourselves and, so, and the cons. And so uh, we can weight them kind of however we want. Like, sure, there are 10 things over here, but each one of them is just a little thing. And so we can ignore those. 
There you go. Going to McDonald's, certainly, right? The, <laughs> the pleasure scale here, the intensity of the McDonald's pleasure, depending on how much you like McDonald's, right? It could be, could be a, what's that? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, the duration, well, see, that's the thing about McDonald's, right? The pleasure of McDonald's duration, that's, I mean, have you ever let fries sit for five minutes? They turn into a something different, right? You got to eat those McDonald's stuff quick. How certain are you that it'll be good? Well, that's one thing is you know that every McDonald's is exactly the same. <laughs> the propinquity, and you can get it in 30 seconds, so it's certainly near. I'm, this is the ideal McDonald's, right? How likely is it to lead to further pleasure of the McDonald's? Probably not so likely. It's not like when you buy one McDonald's, unless it happens to be that one week of the year where you get the puzzle pieces and you can go get new McDonald's for free. The purity of the pleasure, that's the problem with McDonald's right there, right? You're happy for five minutes, and then an hour later, you're really sad. Um, and then, well, the extent is just you, right? Unless you're feeding McDonald's to, like, in order to get your family to be quiet, and so your kids will stop screaming, right? So maybe that's a larger, that might make a lot of people happy, right? depending on who you're around. Um, what? The needs of the many. <laughs> I'll weigh the needs of my children. Um, that's why I only have the one child, so that I can say, I'll weigh the needs. That's right, the needs of the many. <laughs> I'll weigh the needs of the few, or the one. Um, so, so that's the basic idea, right? The math. And as you as as you kind of pointed out, Tracy, that we would need to do this math really quickly. Right? In order to figure out, like the problem with the pros and cons list is you actually have to sit down and write out the thing and think of all the different pros and all the different cons and it takes a little while. And if, if every decision you made in your life, you made that way, well, you'd spend a lot of time making decisions and not very much time doing anything. Right? Uh, that's a problem. Uh, but Bentham's going to say, well, you don't really need to do that. Right? After you've done something once or twice, you have a general sense of, of what's going to how that's going to work out. Or better, you can watch someone else do something like that, and you get a sense of what the outcomes are going to be. So you don't really need to calculate down to every single you know, tenth of a point. You just you have a pretty good sense whether that's going to write. You can look at the five and the one on the train tracks. You don't have to, like, well, hold on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sit down and do the, the whole thing. It's pretty clear five is greater than one. You know, pull the lever. The end. So, uh, how are you feeling about utilitarianism? We started to already talk about some of the problems with utilitarianism, and one of them's there down at the bottom of the screen, uh, and that's what um, sort of what Chelsea was talking about, and then and then Patrick as well. One of the problems with utilitarianism is what we call the uncertain future. The uncertain future. We're focused on consequences, right? Because it's a teleological system. If things are good, they're good. If they're bad, they're bad. The outcomes, that's pretty much all we care about. But what are the outcomes of an action? All the pros and cons. Right? They could go on forever. You have millions of pros and cons. Because in theory, there are an infinite number of possible consequences for any action. All right? You drive out of here on your way home and run a red light. And someone else gets into a car crash, and then that affects their life and their bills and their kids and their right for da 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 da. And just your simple action of driving home has had all of the right. You would never say, "Well, I shouldn't drive home because I might cause an accident on the way there." And da 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 da. Right. So one of the problems with this idea is trying to establish the con what the consequences actually will be. Right? We can't do this math if we don't know the actual consequences. That's a problem. What are some other problems with utilitarianism? I mean, there's some good things that come out of it, too. Maybe I should talk about those first. Okay. This idea of the sheer numbers, right? So just right, we're trying to establish the greatest good for the greatest number. That's how we maximize happiness. 
the greatest good for the greatest number. But number of what? Yeah. 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 Sure. That, but that's getting, that's a problem. Let's not worry about the problems yet. Let's, no, 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 we're trying to, I decided I was going to talk about good things first. I'm going to talk about good things first. So my question is, right, we're talking about the greatest good for the greatest number. Greatest number of what? People, probably. Right? People. What kind of people? What? Sorry, what? Yeah, right. We're, 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 we're thinking about the best consequences for people. Yes? What kind of people? General people. All kinds of people. Every kinds of people. Right? That was kind of Bentham's point behind this whole system. Right? We're not talking about the greatest good for the greatest number of rich people or the greatest good for the greatest number of white people or the greatest good for the greatest number of whatever. It's the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Period. That is actually a pretty revolutionary idea at the time. Right? This is 18th century England. Right? They're in the middle of colonizing all sorts of places all over the world and enslaving people and treating them horribly. Right? And so Bentham is like, nah, ugh, greatest good for the greatest number of people. Period. People. Right? So this is a very egalitarian, egalitarian idea. Right? This where everyone is treated essentially equally. Right? And that's super interesting and good, right? That's a good consequence of this system. All right? It leads to this idea that we are concerned about the greatest good for the greatest number of people, no matter who they are or where they live. That seems like a positive. What is it about people, oh, by the way, what is it about people that we're worried about? Greatest good for the greatest number. Well, we're not even, I don't even want to get into like the yet. I don't want to yet get into the whole, the, the complications that that leads to, right? Because you might not think that what I think is good for you is good for you. But we're going to get to that, I promise. But I, I'm trying to think of the best way to, to, to ask this question because I think you guys can get there because it's a really interesting sort of conclusion or consequence of this theory. Um, why do we care about people? What is it about people? that makes us care about them in terms of this theory, right? We were trying to maximize happiness and pleasure, and we're trying to minimize pain, pain and suffering. So all people count because all people can feel pain and pleasure. But people are not the only things that can feel pain and pleasure, right? What else? Obviously, right? Animals, right? And so according to this theory, if you really kind of expand this theory out, it might, and in fact, some people have argued, include things like animal rights, right? Because suffering is suffering, and pain is pain, right? And so if we're trying to minimize pain, we're trying to minimize pain for everyone, everything, then we should be considering those things that are capable of suffering as well. Yes? And so in some ways, this idea of the sheer numbers of people involved in this calculation can be daunting, right? Wow, there's so many people that I have to think about if, for every action I make. But on the other hand, really encouraging and positive, right? That's a great thing to include, to have a system, to develop a system, an ethical system, that includes more than just like me and my family, right? Or, or just me and my country, right? if you're going to America, making America first again, or, or me and whatever, right? Instead, it's everybody, everyone, and in fact, even maybe animals. So Peter Singer, I'm not going to write his name up. Peter Singer, you're going to read one of his articles uh, this week. Peter Singer is a, a modern philosopher who uh, identifies himself as a utilitarian, and he is a massive animal rights activist. Uh, he's written several books about sort of why people should be vegetarians and why animal rights are important. Um, and he bases it on this idea that, that pain's pain. Doesn't matter who's feeling it. And we should be trying to avoid that in everything that we do in order to be acting morally, ethically, yes? And trying to increase pleasure as much as possible. It's an interesting way of looking at things. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that 100%, but it's interesting. 
How do people feel about that? Is pain pain? Yeah? I mean, do we believe that animals are capable of suffering? Anybody in here not eat meat? That's what, that's what I thought. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I don't know how we reconcile that, but we do. Hmm? McDonald's, you don't eat meat? No. Yeah, God knows what you're eating if you eat a McDonald's. <laughs> it's definitely not meat. It's worms, right? We established that. It's worms. Um, yeah, Burger King's way better, by the way. Um, the, uh, it's Burger King, right? It has to be better. Um, I dated a girl in high school whose father told her that Burger King burgers were made of kangaroo meat, um, which I always thought was really funny. And one of my proudest moments ever was when I responded to that with, wait, you think it's home of the hopper? And that, I, that still makes me chuckle thinking about that. It's the stupidest joke ever. Uh, I love that joke. Anyway, um, my wife would be so disappointed in me right now. Um, sorry, sorry to everybody. Uh, she knows somewhere. She knows she's oh, just went. She what? <laughs> what just happened? Um, so that's a good thing, right? Those are good things. The idea of of equality between human beings and maybe even animals. Uh, this this focus on uh, positive over negative. It makes sense, right? It's a system that that fits with our common intuitions of like, yeah, of course you. Like you save the five and you and you let the one die. That just like nobody in here probably even had to really think about that that long. And I've never ever been in a class where somebody was like, no, no, you, obviously you kill the one guy, right? No one has ever said that in any class I've ever been in. I mean, kill the five guy. Sorry. Uh, the right that it it just fits with with our common sense, and so it seems like a pretty good system. Right, a pretty good way of doing things. If it leads to good consequences, it's a good thing. If it makes people feel good or feel happy, it's good. If it makes people feel bad or unhappy, it's bad. I mean, think about anything that we're supposed to not do, right? Don't murder people because that makes people pretty unhappy, right? Don't steal from people. Don't lie to people, right? All of these things fit pretty clearly into this theory because they do certainly do not maximize pleasure right? uh, and minimize pain. What do you mean by not realistic? Ooh, a dime. Sorry. What? What do you mean by not realistic, Chelsea? And so we would call that moral, ethically bad, right? I mean, that seems to fit into the category. It seems to fit into the, the, to the system, right? That is something that causes pain to other people, and so uh, and and more people than it causes pleasure for. And so it seems like you can say, okay, well then that's, boo, that's bad. And yeah, and in fact, right now we basically we lock up smokers in little rooms. <laughs> you can go smoke there and kill each other, right? But don't mess with us. And that seems to be a pretty good solution to that. So that seems like that's that fits. Is there a different another example? I'm, I'm just trying to get at where you're going with not realistic. All right. You mean automobile gas? Okay, good. Cause, <laughs> I know we've been talking about McDonald's all night, so, but I don't want to. So pollution in general. Yes. It's supposed to like it erodes the ozone. Yes. Yes. According to Al Gore. Huh? No, not according to Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> according to science. <laughs> but okay, go ahead. I mean, Al Gore says the internet. Okay, anyway, I was trying to get it right. Mm. So. Wouldn't that be utilitarian? Like, you mean as an argument for reducing carbon emissions? Right, but we're not. Well, don't confuse the fact that people are stupid and bad <laughs> with it being a bad system, right? It's just, just a way of determining, like, should you control right. carbon emissions? Well, does this system give us an answer to that question? 
it seems to, right? Yeah, it, sure. It makes it's it's easier for you to buy the nice car that you want that guzzles gas um, and to drive fast and to uh, you know dr drive the block to the grocery store instead of you know well the grocery store is a bad example but maybe like I know people who drive to the end of their driveway to check their mail right like the yeah right the, so so yeah that makes you feel good but think about how many people that ultimately that's leading to feeling bad and when you do that math sure sure that seems like a problem yeah so then we would look at this using the system we would establish that driving around that much bad we have an answer that seems to make sense to us potentially Yes? So maybe still good system. Yes? You're looking at me like you don't believe me, but I feel like I feel like we're we're still working on a good system here. Maybe you disagree with that. Maybe you disagree, but I think you would have to then within the system say, well, actually, right, the pleasure that I get from that or the benefit that I get from that is much, much larger than the right. the right negatives. Yeah. We haven't changed the system. Yeah, but that so that doesn't mean this is wrong. That just means that maybe we're jerks. Ah. Uh, well, well, yeah. I mean, what you could say that about every moral system, right? Like, the even just appeal to the Bible. People still murder and cheat and steal, right? Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that the Bible's wrong. It just means people are jerks, right? And so that's not necessarily utilitarianism or the Bible or egoism's fault, right? I mean, pick a, pick a system, right? Um, so that's, that, I mean, that's, right, that's the idea. I'm trying to get to the point that, that people might, might, somebody's gotta be bad, right? The system is establishing that some people are good and some people are bad, and that's still okay. That doesn't break the system. Yes? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I know some. You guys could probably figure some out if we keep talking about it, and that's kind of where I want to, what we're going to do for the rest of the class, yeah, um, is, is figure some out. There are some problems. I don't know about breaking. There are people, there are smart people who are utilitarian, right, and who, who subscribe to this theory. Um, and so what I consider problems, they would have maybe responses to that may or may not convince me and so on. So uh, I don't know if I would say it's broken. I think there are some problems. We've already talked about one big one, and that's that we don't actually know the consequences. Right? Maybe, maybe driving around in cars and emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere will lead to some weird volcanic eruption of Skittles someday that will make everyone on the planet super happy. What's that? No, no, no. It'll, 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 yeah, it'll, it'll seal the ozone layer, and we'll all live happily ever after with Skittles periodically raining down on us that we can eat at our leisure. Maybe, I mean, that's, that's pretty far-fetched, but there, there, there are more realistic possible outcomes there, right? And we don't know. Maybe this is actually for the best that we drive around in SUVs and, and, and so on. Um, sure, well, I mean, and that's the, right, for the, just a quick aside regarding, did I talk about this already, about, the, about global warming? Now, that, that all of the car thing has there are only three ways to actually prevent the whole world from heating up and, and turning into a charcoal. It's stop eating meat, everybody in the room, right? Because cows and animals and pigs and so on cause way more damage to the ozone layer than anything else. It's stop eating meat, stop driving a car altogether. Not like transferring to a hybrid or an electric car, but literally don't drive cars anymore. And stop having children. Not stop. Because electricity is created by coal, by and large. But most of it is. And even, even the, the creation of the materials that go into the car is powered using all the, like we would have to, maybe in a thousand years, We'll be in a position where we can actually build all this stuff without it. Not yet. 
No, we don't have enough. Not in the United States. We don't have people who are putting money into things like water and air and so on. No. It's impossible right now. I don't know, nothing has to be impossible right now, but it is. And then hopefully it won't be for very much longer. All right. Stop eating meat. And have fewer babies. Methane. They pass gas um, and poop. Yeah. Yeah, not as much as animals do because of what we eat. So there would be fewer of them, right? There are huge, huge, huge cattle herds in the United States. Yes, we make them so we can eat them, and then and then that right. If we stopped eating them, there would be far, far, far fewer. What about kids? I don't think we should eat them either. <laughs> well. Yeah. So one child uh, creates as much carbon emissions in one year as something like 35 cars, just as a function of being alive. Yeah. It's just it's just science. So uh, they're not saying you shouldn't have any more children, but like, but that having many many children, families that have four or five six kids, they're they are they're destroying us all. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't say that. Just so we're clear, Patrick said that. Um, what else? Let's take this is that. Sorry, let's stay here. Let's stay here. Um, what are some other problems that we can perceive about utilitarianism? Other than right, we can't always determine the consequences, and so that's hard to do the calculation. Does anybody else have any issues with with this idea? There are some other some other weird bits. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting thing. Bentham believes that you get to pick your own pleasure, right? So the um, he the example he uses is the um, the rich couple who ride in their fancy chariot or whatever they had wagon at the time, the carriage to the opera, and they watch the opera, and that makes them happy, and and that's their pleasure. But on the way into the opera, there's a girl selling flowers so that she can get money to go home and buy a bottle of gin, because that's what she wants. And that's her pleasure. And those are both equally valid and equally acceptable. So what we're trying to do is increase everyone's individual pleasure, whatever they decide is their pleasure. Yep. Then it's, then it's a, a, a net zero if they're equally intense my happiness and your unhappiness, then that's that's a net zero. Yes, yes. If your unhappiness is smaller than my happiness, then it was a good thing. Um, like taxes, taxes are a great example of right. Everybody is unhappy about taxes. We've talked about this before. Nobody likes taxes, but the positive benefits of everybody pooling in and paying some taxes, the the net gain in theory, far outweighs the, the negative, right? That's spread out over a bunch of people, right? The intensity of the displeasure, because it's a relatively small amount of your money, uh, is balanced by the, by the uh, extent of the positives that, that benefit everybody. Again, this is all in theory, yes? So, right, that's an example of using utility to, to right, some people, it might make some people unhappy, but it makes everybody else happy. Another really good example of utility is war. The whole idea of war, right, is that we are going to accomplish some much larger goal at the expense of some number of people who will die, right? We're going to lose X number of soldiers, but it's worth it for whatever it is we're trying to accomplish, right? In, again, in theory, right? Well, that's the idea, right? And you say the whole, we're willing to lose this many soldiers in this fight, and it's, uh, but it's worth it to, you know, how, like the math that is often done, like how many soldiers are we willing to lose in order to win this battle? And if the, if we're going to go over that number, then we won't fight that battle, we'll figure out something else, right? So it's that sort of math that, that is part of the whole idea. That's, that's why the, how many, have you guys seen Saving Private Ryan? Um, the, it's a, that was like the hardest 
30 minutes of my life, the first 30 minutes of that movie. Um, but the reason that's an interesting movie is, and they keep talking about it in the movie, is that it totally goes against the whole idea of utility that war usually involves, right? Normally you, right, you let one guy die to save the six, but here they send six people in to save one guy. Um, and everybody's like, this is, this is crazy. This isn't the way it's supposed to work. And they're, because they are sort of subverting utility um, and not following the normal pattern. Right? And that's kind of the whole point of that movie, um, which, is, which is an interesting point. Um, did I, answer, did I answer that question? I mean, yeah, the point is that some people might be unhappy at times. Okay. But the larger point is that, that there should be more happiness that comes of it. Yes? What if I present this hypothetical? Um, remember the train tracks. Five people over here, one people over here. We kill the one person. Or we let the one person die, however we want to put it. What if we change who that one person is? Yeah, yeah. What if it's your mom? I was thinking that Yeah. Wait, what? Yeah? Sure, sure, sure. That's probably all true. Does it matter? Should it matter? It shouldn't matter. Shouldn't matter. Why shouldn't it matter? Numbers are numbers. Right? We talked about the egalitarian nature of the whole system. It doesn't matter who the people are, or even if they're people. Right? We talked about potentially animals being part of this calculation as well. Right? Every person is worth just as much as every other person. Then it doesn't matter your relationship. I mean, that's going to increase the, your unhappiness, but probably not as much as it will increase the unhappiness of the families of all of the five people who die. But doesn't that just mean that people are bad? Selfish? That's what I mean. That's right? what I mean. Yeah. That yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's going to be my, the, the utilitarian's response is going to be, it's not that utility's broken because you can't kill your mom. It's that you're all selfish people because you're putting the, your mother ahead of all of these five other people who have families and children too. But it's not about maximizing your happiness. That's what makes it selfish, exactly, right? We have a word for that already. What is that? Egoism, yes, right? That's the system where you maximize your own happiness. This is maximizing everyone's happiness. And so, right, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. And then we also get to Crystal's question before. How old are the people on the track? Right? This is the... <laughs> Right. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the assumption when you ask that question, right? This is a classic lifeboat scenario, right? There, you've got a lifeboat, and there are 20 people on the boat, but only seats for 15. Who do you boot? It's actually a really interesting uh, exercise. One of these days, I'm going to do this class. I'm going to start this class with with that. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not talking about killing each other. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell Crystal's been thinking about this, right? If I were on a love boat with these guys, who would I kill first? <laughs> That's something, like on the first day, that was the first thing. She walked in and was like, ah, that guy's got to go. Um, uh, well, they could just keep your glasses. I'm just saying. Um, glasses take up way less space than you do. <laughs> um, but it's a really interesting question about, like, if you were, like, the, the right way to do it is to have a list of people, hypothetical, fictional people, right? And you go through you in, in a, like a little group, like I would pair you up or something, and you would pick the 15 that you would, that you would save and why, right? It's a really interesting exercise in sort of how we value people. I mean, and, and I bet you, this is what, a great thing, if I bet you if I put a dog on that list, that would be the first, per, first person, first thing off the boat for everybody. And yet, and yeah, right, it's, that dog is just as capable of suffering and drowning as anybody else is, right? Can't complain about it. Not in English. Um, it's, it's an interesting point. Like, how, what, what do we value? But according to a utilitarian, well, I shouldn't say that. Some people are going to say, oh, a utilitarian says you should just pick them randomly, right? Because everybody's totally equal. But a utilitarian might say, 
well, actually, you need to kind of do the math. Like, if that person is going to has an inoperable brain tumor and is going to die in a week anyway, all right, boot them, all right, something like that. Like, you know, there's there's it's more complicated than just everybody is equally valuable. That's true, but all right, but we can do a little bit more math than that. Right? Uh -huh. Uh, well, yeah, we know what Crystal do. <laughs> Are they old dogs? <laughs> um, I'm not necessarily, just so we're clear, I'm not necessarily saying that humans and dogs are equally valuable, right? Um, I'm not sure even that Peter Singer, who is that animal rights guy, I don't th know that he would say that humans and dogs are equally valuable. He's just saying that dogs have value, right? That they're, that they have some, so they, are, they enter into the math somewhere. That's all he was saying. Uh, what else? What else? Yeah, what else can be problematic with utilitarianism? If we're thinking about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, can we imagine any other areas where it might lead to situations that we find disconcerting? Mm -hmm. So, and so that's a 50-50 split almost in this country. So, yeah. It's almost. Yeah, I mean, that is one thing about taxes, right? And this is the, I think John Stewart is the one who, who very well, put it very well when he said, like, the thing about taxes is you don't get to pick how they get spent. That is not up to you. Um, like, there are lots of ways. Like, he was talking, I think, about the um, uh, federal, uh, like, Planned Parenthood funding. But like there are lots of people who are opposed to military spending, and they don't get to like get all up in arms and say you can't spend my money on bombs. And so the people who right who are have problems with Planned Parenthood don't get to pick how we spend the tax money there either. Um, but the theory is that sure you might be unhappy with some ways in which that money is being spent, but overall. You like having an army to protect you and police force and fire department and roads and all those sorts of things. So the much larger benefits should outweigh the negatives. And if they don't, then you probably are either part of a weird militia out in the middle of Montana or are planning to leave the country. Right? I mean, because you're not happy with what's here. I don't know. Maybe not. Um, yeah, Chelsea. Uh-huh. Which word? Utilitarianism? Okay. Yeah. That's that's not unique to utilitarianism though, right? Anytime a moral decision is made, it might depend on who's making the decision as to like whether we think it was actually correct, right? Um the what we want to do here is think about the system as it stands, and does it seem to work sort of ideally, like in a, in, a, in a neutral world where everybody is, like if everybody were to act this way, now I don't mean a utopia, but I just mean if, if everybody subscribed to this system, this utilitarian system, would the world be a better place? Or what are some of the potential outcomes that, would, that could happen if everybody were on board with this, you think it would be World War III if this happened? If we were utilitarian? If everybody were utilitarian, it would be World War III? Why? Because what if what's good for the group that they're considered, what if the group is not all of mankind? What but the group is all of mankind. That's the system. Yeah. Yeah. You can't say, like, like, well, I'm North Korea, and I'm only going to worry about maximizing pleasure for North Koreans, because that's not utilitarian anymore, right? That's just, 
that's nationalistic. You know, that's, that's a different thing. That's a different program. It has to include all people. All right. Tashan, did you have, were you going to say something earlier? No. It's Tony? I can't, I can never tell if you've got your hand up or. You were, but then you weren't. Time. When you asked the question, I was going to answer the question. <laughs> okay. I think like you forgot the question or you forgot your answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, both. Okay. Okay. Um, what? Oh, oh yeah, good. Go. <laughs> I think you guys, I don't know what it's called, but I was going to say um, organic or healthy people. Um, uh-huh. And it was some, the question or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, there's not really, I mean, you kind of, you broke your question. I don't remember oh, okay. either, but you broke your response when you said healthier. Like, obviously, healthier food is healthier right. by definition. So. There you go, right? So, yeah, presumably, health, yes, healthy for people, right. right? So that's better, right? Because anything that increases health increases pleasure over the long run, right? As opposed to the alternative, yeah, so. Um, what, about, what about the idea that we are focused on consequences, as we are, yes? So if something has good consequences, it's good. If it has bad consequences, it's bad, yes? Yeah, but let's say we do. Let's say we discover the consequence. Let's say we do something and the consequence is really obvious. Like, uh, I mean, because sometimes they are, right? Like if I shoot a person with a gun, the consequences there are pretty straightforward, right? I mean, I could say, well, what if it was going to grow up to be Hitler? But I mean, we're not, we're not getting into that, right? If I shoot a person with a gun, that person dies, that's pretty straightforward consequences, yes? So sometimes the consequences are pretty simple, or at least pretty easy to identify. Um, what if I am walking behind a guy down the sidewalk and I pick his pocket and I steal his wallet and as I'm making my getaway, I trip and throw, I lose the wallet, I drop it and it lands into like the Salvation Army guy's bucket. At the end of the day, money has gone to the Salvation Army to help feed hungry children maybe or to clothe them or something like that. Maybe, sure, sure. Maybe the salvation, right? But the point is that the consequences are no. The consequences are the Salvation Army got the money. Like, right? If I just walked up and put money, like put my own money into the Salvation Army bucket, is that a good thing? Yeah. Yes, because the consequences are good. Salvation Army gets some money. If I steal the money from Tracy and put it in the Salvation Army bucket, are the consequences the same? They're not exactly the same, but let's say Tracy has a billion dollars. Right? Losing, losing the hundred dollars he has in his pocket right now won't hurt him at all, really. Right in the long run, that's the the consequence. Right? The the intensity of that pain, losing a hundred dollars, is nothing. It's like that dime, right? Whether or not I pick up that dime, not going to impact my life. Not the point. We don't care about shoulds and shouldn'ts. We're talking about consequences. Consequences, consequences, consequences. All we care about are the consequences. Taishan. Sounds like it, right? Like that hundred dollars is going to make a big deal to the Salvation Army. That could buy who know you know a bunch of meals. Something. Yes, the the pleasure created by the giving of the money to the Salvation Army compared to the pain of Tracy's loss of his hundred dollars. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't trip. Maybe you just decided. Like you felt bad about it halfway down the street, and you're like, "Oh, I can't give it back, so I'm just going to give it to the Salvation Army." Ultimately, you're a good person. <laughs> yes, but the math is that the good outweighs the bad. That's right. The needs of the one. Needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. Right? Right? I don't care about intent. That's what I'm saying. It causes how easily if you're looking 
Sure, you're a bad person. Absolutely, initially, at first. I take that money because I think that the consequences are going to be, I'm going to have $100 that I can go spend on McDonald's and have a feast, right? Yeah, but it turns out that, for whatever reason, due to bad luck, I trip or something like that, I throw that money into the accidentally into the uh, Salvation Army bucket. The actual consequences, not what I predicted, but what actually ends up happening, was really good for a bunch of people. So, yeah, I'm, I, I, I still did a bad thing, but overall the action was a good thing. So in, act, in actuality, I did a good thing. I'm a good person. Yep. And then I would have been bad. Bad outcome, I would have been a bad person. Or at least I did a bad act. But because it didn't end up that way, I did a good act. Because what we're focusing on are is the outcome. What's that? I didn't hear it. I just said that it happened. No, you said they were kind of leaving it I'm the author. Yeah, it's not. We're not asking. This is not like a for the purposes of like legal trial. We're just trying to decide a system in order to to determine good actions and bad actions. Robin Hood, right? The many many poor people benefited, and some small number of rich people suffered, and so Robin Hood was a good guy according to utilitarianism, and, in fact, according to lots of people. All right? The, well, I mean, I, <laughs> it, is it right or is it wrong? Is Robin Hood a good guy? Sure. According to utilitarianism, Robin Hood is totally a good guy. Well, obviously. Yeah, no. If if Robin Hood, yes. If Robin Hood took the money and kept it, then yeah, he'd be a bad guy. That's nobody's arguing that. But he didn't, right? He took the money and then he gave it to poor people. Yes. And so Robin Hood, good guy. But but if I take Tracy's money and give it to the Salvation Army, I'm a bad guy. No, you're not. I'm a good guy. Okay. <laughs> I'm part of right. The the thing here is, what is the conflict? The conflict is that the system says one thing, but it feels weird, right? Like it's conflicting with common sense, and that's where. Wh how do we get past that? Um, that's hard. It's tricky. That's right. If the outcome, and, and vice versa, right? And vice versa. I could build a hospital for a bunch of sick children, but it just so happens that that hospital is built on top of a uh, nuclear waste dump. Sure, and all those children come to the hospital and they get irradiated and get even sicker. And so I'm a bad guy because I took an action that led to a whole lot of sick children. Sure. Yes. Absolutely. I'm a hero now because I took horrible money and made good things out of it. But should it, But should you be right? Even if I, even if somebody finds out I built the hospital with drug money, and somebody finds out, whoa, he built that hospital with drug money. If the world were utilitarian, everyone would be like, oh yeah, all right. Yeah, but he built a hospital. <laughs> good work, that guy. Right. So how do we, I mean, and again, that some, for some people, that feels weird. Um, but according to utilitarian, everything's okay with that. Um, we're doing on time. Huh, we're actually pretty far ahead. Um, Bentham dies, as all people do. He is succeeded by his godson, John Stuart Mill. 
uh, his actually his his best friend was this guy James Mill, who helped him with a lot of this a lot of his thought and helped him to put a lot of this stuff together. Uh, James had a son named John. He named him John. He wasn't just born that way. Uh, John Stuart Mill, and John Stuart Mill ends up becoming one of the more famous philosophers uh, ever, based on his sort of taking Bentham's theory and expanding it, refining it. He recognizes some of the problems with this, right? Uh, he he recognizes some people criticize some people at the time criticize utilitarianism because it seemed to be focused on physical pleasure. It was called, uh, you know, the, the ethics of swine, right? Because, you know, you're just worried about your physical, like, happiness, filling yourself up, right? It's not about the intellectual happiness sort of thing. Um, you know, the uh, should you want to go and see that opera that I was talking about before, or should you want to stay home and have some nachos and beer and watch football? And, uh, you know, Bentham is going to say they're both the same, but a lot of people at the time are like, well, they're not both the same. Clearly, they're not both the same. So how do we get around that? And John Stuart Mill showed up and said, well, actually, there are, there are things that are higher and lower pleasures. He tried to, to sort of classify things, like the opera is a higher pleasure and the, you know, cheeseburger is a lower pleasure. Um, and so we should be aiming at sort of the higher sort of things. Um, I only mentioned this. I don't think this is a very good answer. I think that that if you're classifying, what I, can can anybody see the problem with that? Right. It was supposed to mitigate the idea, but does anybody see what? The, I mean, obviously that makes this turns them into sort of a, a snob, but it also there's a real actual logical problem there. Yeah, right, right. You may not think that opera is a higher pleasure, but he's going to say, but that's just because you're wrong. Um, it actually is. But there's a problem there. Does anybody see it? What's not being measured? This is kind of like, remember when we talked about the problem with um, relativism? And we talked about the idea that, like, uh, tolerance is a virtue of relativism, right? Is a universal thing, but relativism's whole idea is that there are no universals. So it was internally inconsistent. There's a problem here that's internally inconsistent. So the higher and lower pleasures really about where if you're wrong, then you're not. So there's like a sense of inequality. Yeah, the, the idea is that you should be trying to aim at those higher pleasures, right? So that even the lower class should be educated in regard to those higher pleasures so that they can see how much better they are, right? That was Mill's idea. It was not just like... I would say that the lower people, if they put their pleasures in according to the higher pleasures, then mm -hmm. they would lose every time, and that would be one. Yeah, well, but that's how, but you teach them to like the higher ones. That's his response. Mm -hmm. But you could be taught, right, to enjoy those things more. <laughs> that's only because you haven't, don't you don't know better, right? I mean, that's what John Stuart Mill is saying. I don't like Hopper either, but he's saying, you know, you, you just don't, just haven't been exposed to it correctly. Yeah. Yeah, he is kind of deciding, right? And the whole problem here, right, is that if he's deciding, what is he using to decide? Yeah, his own system that has nothing to do with utility. He is somehow establishing some other alternate system of what is good and bad that is distinct from this. And so he's actually stepping out of his whole utilitarian framework to come up with some other method of, of measurement. Yeah, I mean, the. I know we hate that. That's one of those things that we, we particularly Americans, despise, right? Other people making decisions for us, right? But that's not really, it's not so much that it's a personal thing. It's the fact that he is not using the system that he is supposedly trying to develop, right? He's using a different system, using a different metric. Um, and we don't even know what that metric is. And he's the one who's coming up with it.
Um, last thing, notice I did not give you a break. I know, I know, we've been chugging through. But I'm only going to talk about one more thing, and then we're going to maybe do a little bit of a real life, real life thing, if I can remember what it was I was going to talk about. I don't remember. Um, is this, uh, John Stuart Mill also comes up with this idea of act utilitarianism versus rule util utilitarianism. Now I can't say it like Chelsea can. What we've been talking about up to this point is act utilitarianism. Each meaning it's a utility. It's like you're doing the math. You're doing the calculus for each individual act. Right? Like, should I do this thing? Well, let me think. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to do that thing. And should I do this thing? Well, let me think. Uh, do the math, do the math, do the math. Yeah, okay, I'll do this thing. Right? And that can be really hard, as we talked about, right? Trying to do all that math, right? Like instantaneously, trying to figure out the, the, the you know, the five versus one is easy, but other things, pros and cons lists, take a long time. And so John Stuart Mill suggests this rule utilitarianism issue. <clears throat> Imagine that instead of um, saying, does this act create more pleasure than pain, you were to ask yourself, do acts like this act cause more pleasure than pain? Right? So you're, you're creating sort of a category of activities like, like charity. Do things like giving to charity cause more pleasure than pain? And if the answer is yes, then you don't have to do the math every single time you donate. You know that donating things is a good thing, and so you can just go do it without having to do all of the math. Right? And then you don't have, should I, should I kick this puppy? Right? Well, I know that it's going to cause more pain than it does pleasure, even though I like kicking puppies. So uh, I know that generally puppy kicking is the sort of thing that causes more pain than pleasure, so I should not kick puppies, this puppy or any puppy. And so I don't have to do the math every single time. I can establish rules like kicking puppies is not okay because it causes more pain than pleasure, not because there's some thing about like, well, you ought not to kick puppies just because, you know, I don't like you to or something like that. Yes? Does that make sense? Kashan? Yeah, you, you're sort of generalizing the consequences. Rather than trying to determine the math for every single consequence, possible consequence, you're sort of saying, yeah, like every time in the past when I've donated money, it is to such and such charity. It's it's led to them being able to help people and make the world a better place and cause more pain or pleasure than pain. So donating, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna do it again tomorrow without having to go through all the math because I've established this rule that donating charity donating charity is good. Now, if you find out that in fact the CEO of that charity has been pocketing all of your money and not actually affecting, you know, causing good in the world, then you could totally change your rule. Or or you could you could skip it this one time. I like to generally give to charities. However, that one charity is bad. They've only got one star on Charity Navigator, so I don't give them anything, right? So generally it's good, but right? So you can adjust your rules and even ignore them sometimes when when the when the consequences actually turn out to be more pain than pleasure. Yes. So we're still using this hedonistic calculus as the as the subsystem, if that makes sense, and using that to establish some basic rules that you can then follow, which of course is what we do, right? Like, uh, it's, you shouldn't cheat on your taxes, right? Because it actually causes more pain than pleasure in the long run, and so rather than having to prove that or do the math or demonstrate whatever we just say, don't, and we've established a rule. Right? And rules can be positive or negative. Right? I always do this thing. That is my rule. Or I never do this thing. That is a rule as well. Yeah? So 
that's and this actually was really utilitarian as my idea. Actually, in a lot of ways, fixes some of the concerns that we've had so far, right? Like the Robin Hood issue. If we've established a rule that you should never steal, then we never even get to the point of you shouldn't steal and give it to charity or give it to poor people. We don't even have to have that problem. And you don't have to, right? And it also takes care of the uncertain future problem because you don't have to know all of the consequences because you couldn't possibly know all the consequences. But generally, right, this rule has been established because it usually leads to more good than bad. And so we do that, right? So, so Mill actually has a really good sort of approach here in trying to establish larger guidelines rather than having to do the math for every single activity, if that makes sense, if that makes sense. Um, when you're doing your reading this week, I want you to, to think about, because there, there are some really interesting readings here, actually, I think. These are some of my favorite readings in the whole course. Um, the, the, that's good. But like the blacksmith and the baker, oops, I just skipped over it. Blacksmith and the Baker, and the this is just a um, a short story. Both of these are just short stories. Uh, they're a fiction, fun fiction stories, but they do a pretty good job of um, of demonstrating some of the problems with utility, with utilitarianism. Um, but think as you're reading these, think about rule utilitarianism and see if it has an answer. I'm not sure that it does, but it might have an answer to some of the problems you're going to see in those stories. They're pretty fun, I think. Um, last problem with utility. I know I said I was only going to talk about one more thing, but I just remembered another problem with utility and utilitarianism that we didn't mention. I'm sorry. General rule, you should keep your word. I'm breaking that rule right now. The five guys and the one guy. Easy, easy math because Right, everybody here has done some sort of math in high school. Maybe you've done some physics, right? A little calculus, whatever. What do we always talk about? What do you have to add when you're doing a calculation? You've got to have your number, and then after it, you've got to like, how far can you run in an hour? And you might say eight, and they're going to be like, eight, eight, eight what? Right? You've got to add your units. Right? Got to have your units. When the units are equivalent, utilitarianism is easy. Five people versus one people. Easy math. What if it were five people and a jar with a cure for cancer? That's easy. It's not as easy, but it's still pretty easy because we're talking about people, lives being saved, right? But what if I replace the jar with a cure for cancer with a um, uh, million dollars? Can we compare five people to a million dollars? A billion dollars? All the money? What if it was literally all the money in the world? If it was going to destroy all the money in the world or five people? And it would destroy the world economy and cause chaos, and there would be who knows what would go up. I don't know. Maybe that's a weird example, bad example. But when we start talking about like making real life decisions, I could go to school, get a degree, and go get a job that's going to give, pay X amount of money. Right, big, I don't know, big money. Or I could get a job right now and it's gonna pay X amount of money. And probably the X after the college is bigger than the X before the college. That seems like easy calculation. You go for the bigger. Right? But what about all the time involved in the college? How does that get added into the calculation? How do we make money equal time plus money is it less than, greater than, equal than, equal to? I don't know. I don't know how we get time in there as a unit, right? Uh, what if we're calculating just literally physical pleasure? It doesn't even have a unit, right? Like if I'm a cigarette smoker, Chelsea brought that up earlier about like, um, you know, poisoning other people. That seems bad. But what if I just want to smoke a cigarette? And because it, it makes me feel good, but ultimately it's doing damage to my body. Right? So pleasure versus shortening my lifespan. How do we compare those two units? How do we measure those two things? How do I know which one, if, I'm, if the pleasure of the, smoke, of the cigarette is greater than the pain caused by my life being three months shorter? I don't know how to do that math. 
right? the units. And that's why pros and cons lists often don't work. Because how do you compare the pro of, say you want to move. I'll be in a better school district, but I will have a tiny yard. Like, how do you measure, how do you compare those two, two units? They don't seem to equate in any way. How many tiny yards do you have to have to equal one good school district? I, I, that's, that's a nonsensical question. So the, that can be one of the real big challenges in doing the math that I was talking about before. If the units don't, sometimes the units do match up, right? I could get an Xbox on Amazon for $35, or I can go to GameStop and it costs 200 Which one should I pick? Well, that's easy, because dollars and dollars. But when the units don't match, things get really hard to do. And that makes utilitarianism, utilitarianism just harder to use. And if you can't use it, it's not a good system. Chelsea. Uh -huh. If there are five people on both sides, anybody? That's when you push the fat guy off the, <laughs> off the bridge. Uh, I mean, what do we think? If there were five people on both sides, how would that math work? It's net zero. Flip a coin. Naturally. <laughs> um, in the, right. It depends on how we're going to do the math. At its most base, at the most basic level, people are people. Right? So, uh, so again, it's totally a coin flip. Right? Five people are going to die here. Five people are going to die here. Um, if it's, it gets more complicated, as Crystal was pointing out, if some of them are old, some of them are young, some of, maybe you have an inherent bias towards men and women, men or women, but that's, of course, not built into the utilitarian. That's not utilitarianism's fault. That's your fault, right? Um, what if, uh, for some reason, oh, oh, ooh, what if the tracks uh, are different elevations? So the track on the right is going downhill, and the train's going to go really fast. It's going to kill those five people, but like instantly. But this way, the train's going uphill. It's still going to kill those five people, but it's going to hurt a lot because it's going to like drag them down the tracks. Obviously, we want to go downhill, right? We want to minimize pain. So that matters, potentially. Math. So much math, right? It's a lot of math. Right. So the rule utilitarian is going to say you should have a, you should always have that prepared just in case it comes up. You should think about like what happens if I'm walking to work tomorrow and I come across a train. That's obviously not a thing that's going to happen. That's right. Do you? No. Yeah. Avoid train tracks. Um, are there questions? Does this make sense? Do we know our homework? Uh, our homework is a lot like last week's homework. It is. To, uh, to read and respond. So we've got um, just a description of utility, Bentham's version of utility, the encyclopedia entry for utility, and then a response to that, just sort of establishing that you know what utility is. And your, what, what? somebody started to ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Bentham's. Yeah, I mean, you should read it. All right, read this. Read this. Okay? Then you're responding here to basically identify the concept of moral right and wrong. This is basically just a description of what is the concept here behind utilitarianism. And do you like it? Why? Yes? Okay. That's all that. And that's, again, should be brief. Should be brief. And then this is Peter Singer's uh, argument. Uh, da -da -da -da. This is uh, an article he wrote for the paper um, about a young woman named Ashley who had some medical issues and medical intervention. And so uh, this is also, I think, really interesting. Uh, it happened in 2006. And so you're just identifying how his argument is utilitarian, how it fits into the idea of utilitarianism, right, based on what we know about utility. 
And then finally, you've got Blacksmith and the Baker and then the ones who walk away from Omos. Both of those, by the way, are due on Sunday. The two short answers due on Sunday, as usual, right, Sunday. And then you've got a paper that is based on these two readings. Neither one of them is very long. Right? I think this is two pages long. This is probably not even a page. Right? So very short readings. But I want you to think a little bit about what's going on, because both of these are going to bring up problems for utilitarianism, for utility. And so I want you to think about what are those problems? Are they, in fact, problems? Right? Uh, the question is, are the actions taken here um, appropriately utilitarian? Are they, in fact, maximizing pleasure, minimizing pain? Um, if they are, is that a problem for utility? Or uh, if it's not, why is it not even utilitarian? Yes? So hopefully I've made the question pretty clear, all the questions clear. Um, if you're at a loss, if you're at a spot in your paper and you're not sure that you're answering it correctly or whatever, just come back to this. Read the question. Make sure you're answering the question. Okay? The questions. They're plural questions. Yes? Always focus on answering the questions. If you do that, you can't go wrong. Well, you can, but hopefully you won't. All right. Look at me. I'm the nicest guy ever. I'm letting you guys go. Have a good week. I will see you next Wednesday. Yay!